Welcome back to the Mob Mentality Show. I'm Austin Chadwick, and uh, we have our co-host Chris Lucian with us. And we're really excited to have Greg Eisenberg today. Uh, he's got some. Uh, we got some great topics lined up. But to get us started, Greg, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how uh, your background relates to mob programming? Sure, sure. So uh, I've been the director of engineering at a company that does um, software that helps organizations eliminate paperwork and codify their automated business processes. So that's the area that I focus on. Um, and prior to that, I was doing a uh, director of software and firmware for a company that did concentrated solar power. And before then I worked for Microsoft in many different forms and factors for many years. Um, and there I kind of got into agile. Uh, I was bringing agile concepts to the organization a little bit of swimming upstream uh, at the time in the early 2000s. Uh, I was focused a lot on things like fast, short iterations, uh, unit testing, uh, using user stories to quantify our use cases or our uh, requirements. Um, and I had a lot of uh, uh, success with unit testing. I had a lot of success with fast iterations, but I really had a hard time getting people to adopt things like pair programming. And I really had a hard time with changing the mentality around uh, collaborative ownership and whole team approach. So while I felt very successful on certain aspects of tactics and practices, uh, there were certain areas of team management and, and goals that I just weren't able to ever uh, fully accomplish. All right, right on. That's awesome. And I think that's a good transition to our uh, first topic, which is uh, challenges to adoption. And you had traditional job titles. You want to kick that off a little bit? Sure. Um, let me try to find some notes here real quick. So, um, so historically, at a lot of organizations, you have uh, software engineers who build the code, software engineers and test who automate your testing or automate your CI, CD pipelines. And then you have your test engineers who will do your manual testing, or maybe they write some test scripts and so on. And so at one organization where I brought mobbing over, those traditional uh, titles were a little bit of an impediment. So you have your normal mob programming adoption impediments, uh, ego being number one, uh, management support probably being number two. Uh, and so uh, we were getting past some of those initial things. We had some, uh, um, some go ahead from management to say, give it a try. Uh, we had some individuals on the team who were willing to, uh, to, to try this. And so the egos were kind of out of the way and the management support was a little out of the way. But we definitely had hesitation from, organization, from teams where we had engineers and test engineers in the same organization. They didn't know how to mob together. Uh, and so we tried the Nike approach, just do it. Um, and that really helped. Um, uh, you know, we just went for it. Uh, what we learned was that uh, testers think differently and they bring a really phenomenal value to the mob. Uh, we had a lot of problems where testers were only test or developers were only testing the happy path and the develop the testers brought that other perspective of the negative test cases, the boundary test cases, the big test case, the very tiny test case. Um, Similarly, our testers asked great questions. Uh, they really helped keep the users, um, uh, the, the users' perception front and center of what we were building. And they also really helped us stay focused on the scope of the stories. Uh, sometimes you get into these modes where the description is clear, the acceptance criteria is clear, but you've got a group of people building code and they start adding stuff that's not in the story. And our testers were, were sort of our help, our, our traffic cops, perhaps. Uh, they, they, they helped us you know, say, hey, you know what? That seems like a new story. Let's put that on a card. Let's stick it on a board and uh, make it the next story, but let's stay focused on the scope at hand. So those are some ways that uh, integrating testers into our mobs really helped and how we overcame some of those traditional title problems. You know, actually, when, um, when mob programming first started, uh, the, the team was five people. One person was still had the title of tester. Another person had just transitioned from tester to software engineer. So um, I'd say two-fifths of the team of the original kind of like mob programming mob was, uh, was um, you know, two-fifths test, tester or testing background. Um, and we noticed a similar effect. It was, it was very similar where we had... We had um, more comprehensive, like when we when we were doing unit testing, more comprehensive unit tests. They they uh, caught a lot of different kind of edge cases, and that was that was a really uh, positive thing uh, for being on the team. 
Um, and gradually over time, our testers all kind of transitioned titles to software engineer um, as, as we were doing the modding. So it was a very interesting experience. What we found was we had some test engineers who traditionally are not solid developers. They are they, they can write a little bit of test scripts, but they really prefer to be manual testers. And when they jo they were a little hesitant to join the mobs because they didn't want to slow the mob down and they didn't want to show they didn't want to be the driver ever they didn't want to be typing and they didn't want to have to be responsible for the code so we ended up having them join the mobs anyway uh and we would let them bow out of driving um but their influence was still exceptionally important uh and it became very very uh effective very cool very cool um, we had some other uh, kind of ways of dealing with testing and mobbing. So we actually created what we called, uh, what we called mob testing. Nice. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> our mob testing kind of came in two or three different flavors. Uh, one is we would have a mob only of testers that we would use early in feature development in an effort to enumerate test cases and flesh out corner cases uh, and explore various interactions. So we would actually use the mob testing uh, as an approach to improving acceptance criteria, as an approach to coming up with sort of like, instead of user story acceptance criteria, feature level acceptance criteria or epic level acceptance criteria. And then towards the end of a product uh, or end of a big feature effort, we would do mob testing as well, where we would do a lot more actual testing uh, and we would validate acceptance criteria, uh, ensure integrations with existing features, uh, preventing regressions and so on. And these, um, these mob testing sessions were actually sometimes quite big. Uh, we have pictures of people with you know, 15 testers around a session. What we would do is um, we would have a big group and we would kind of introduce the topic and we would follow a kind of a session-based testing approach. So session-based testing, uh, you can read about it online. Uh, the idea is you wanna focus down a certain path at a time. So you have a session, a time-bound session focused on covering one area of a feature or one area, one, one pathway. And so we would use these big mob testing sessions to introduce an area and then we would break out into smaller mob testing groups and we would typically add a new role to our mob uh, we would add a recorder uh, the recorder uh, would keep track of ideas that people had come up with that we weren't focused on at the moment. So if you're testing a certain path and you have a variation, the recorder would help keep track of that so we could come back and do that. So we, uh, we, we, um, Every Wednesday had the, the QA mob uh, and uh, teams could sort of ask the QA mob to focus on their area as their areas became mature enough to, uh, to need it. Um, or they could ask the QA mob to help sort of brainstorm uh, acceptance criteria and or other types of testing criteria that they could use to uh, improve the, uh, the coverage. Fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah, I had a, one follow-up question for you. So in these mob testing sessions, is it largely manual testing or is it writing automation or? Uh... So we, the QA mobs were almost always manual testing sessions. Yeah, cool. they were uh, big exploration testing sessions. Um, we did have a lot, we do have a lot of mobs focused on testing and driven by testers. Uh, and those tend to focus more on automation frameworks, uh, building CI CD pipelines uh, and building tools that others can use uh, that, are, that are less product and more infrastructure. Um, and so we do have some uh, mobs that are, we, we have a tools mob that's all driven by testers. And then a lot of teams will do, um, uh, we still use a lot of um, individual owners of stories. And so that owner will decide, hey, I want a mob on this story. And that story might be to build out a pipeline and th it'll be driven by the tester, but it's a, it's a whole team mob. That's awesome. That's super cool. Yeah, I have some uh, yes and stories to that. Uh, we we are my the current mob I'm in is uh, developers, and I have somewhat of a QA background. I went through a software quality certification, the American Society of Quality, and various other trainings. Um, but it's just interesting when we because we'll do manual testing as we're developing, right? Uh, uh, whether it's on the device or on the software, and it's so interesting. Uh, it's been a really cool experience because people always think of something a test case that I've never thought of, right? And so one recent one was we entered the email with lowercase uh, or with different casing, and it was just someone's in the mob's idea to do that. 
And that exposed a bug that none of us had thought of uh, before. And if I bet if I was alone, it would have been hard to see. And so uh, I almost think this is inspiring me to write a pull request for Willem's uh, mob programming RPG. Uh, <laughs> so there is an acronym out there called Zombie uh, for test cases. And I'm looking at it online right now. It's uh, Z the Z is for zero case, uh, the O is for the one case, the M is for the mini. The B is for the boundary, I is for interface definition, and then exercise, exceptional behavior is the E. And so I've noticed that people with a more testing mindset usually bring all those cases uh, to, to thought when, you know, maybe a developer who may have not thought of those. And so maybe the mob programming rule would be the, the zombie. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I'm not sure I want that role, <laughs> especially in today's situation. So it'd be, it would be the, uh, the, the getting the zombies under control, maybe. That would be the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, cool. So I guess what I'm hearing from you is, you know, you're talking about trying to get organizations to lean into uh, uh, trying out experimenting with mob programming. Uh, and it sounds like you're saying that the roles could sometimes be a barrier. Uh, well, I definitely think the roles are a barrier on two levels. One is um, mm -hmm. there are people who think that their job is one job. And when you ask them to mob, it changes that job a little bit. Uh, okay. And then there is the, um, uh, then there is the technical barrier. Uh, and like I said, that we, we had some software test engineers who were very reluctant to join the mob because they felt that they were going to be an impediment uh, they didn't want to drive. Uh, and we had some software engineers who were not so sure that they wanted the test engineers in the mob. Um, and this kind of goes to the ego problem um, uh, that you sometimes run into on Teams, period. But they, they didn't want to slow down. They didn't want to have to explain things and so on. So there, there, there's it, it, the, the traditional titles, I do think, are... Uh, are, are something that needs to be overcome and needs to be needs to be part of the working agreement for a mob uh, to be able to deal with. Yeah, and and uh, I, I think that um, again, kind of going back to stories when we were first starting out, um, when we were just five people, we we kind of agreed to ignore the roles, right? Like, and, and actually, the person that um, that maybe uh, their request for help instigated our first event of mobbing. Um, they were essentially the most senior person on the team and asking for help from more junior people. And so, so we didn't have the ego problem then. And then by the time we were hiring more mobbers, um, I think we put a lot of effort in designing out or designing away the ego from both the interview and our uh, roles. Um, you know, talking about the most senior role is going to be the one training others the most and things like that, um, as well as, still finding ways to learn new things. And so we kind of have like a little bit of humbleness built in that sort of stuff. But um, I can understand going into an existing team uh, and having to transition them um, is, is a complicated procedure to say the least. <laughs> Yeah, I think willingness to try is the first, uh, the, first the, the first ingredient to get mobbing accepted is a willingness to try. Yep. Uh, and I think that's very much of an agile mindset perspective. So uh, it, it helps to have people willing to try new things. Yep. Yeah, it kind of goes, kind of goes back. I don't know if we bring it up every episode now, but the diffusion of innovation, right? Uh, you want to find the people who are willing to try, right? And then make your mobs around, around that, um, that group of people. But yeah, cool. Um, this might be a good time to transition to our next topic, which is, Teams who selectively mob. Uh, do you want to intro that a little bit, Greg? Sure. So, uh, you know, at the company that I've been at for the last several years, uh, there are about 20, 22, 23 teams, depending on how you, uh, you know, slice and dice the, the, the organization up. Um, but that's about how many projects and backlogs there are there. And a little over half of them have adopted mobbing to some degree in their uh, in, in their regular course of sprints and uh, product development, but only two or three mob all the time. Um, in the teams that mob all the time, uh, they've made it part of their working agreements. And even them, they usually do four to six hours worth of mobbing a day. Uh, they are, they're typically in their working agreements, they have things like all production code needs to be mobbed. Um, all test automation for the production code is mobbed. 
but then they have certain work that is individual work. So they do a lot of spike work and research uh, on their own. Um, they review support cases typically in a solo environment, although they'll bring the, 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 you know, if the support case is hard to reproduce or they can't understand how the issue got through tech support, um, they'll bring that back to the mob. And then similarly, reviewing automation and load testing results tend to be a um, kind of an individual's job. And then they bring the results back to the mob the next day. Um, there are other teams that are much, much more selective in mobbing. And so they may only have two or three stories in a sprint that are mobbed. Uh, and so they made two or three days of the week mob and then the rest of the week not mob. Uh, and what they end up doing is usually at story grooming time and planning time, they pick which stories are good mobbing candidates. And there's various criteria that I've seen kind of evolve as kind of a common um, set of criteria that makes a good mobbing candidate. So usually good mobbing candidates are where it's new code for everybody. So there's nobody that's an expert and they all can kind of learn together. Um, the other one is when there's one person who's an expert and we need everybody to be ramped up. So those, both of those uh, conditions, it's kind of funny, both of those conditions tend to make good mobbing stories. Another one are when it's well scoped clear acceptance criteria and it's one of those really fun stories that everybody kind of wants a piece of uh so <laughs> some of the not so good candidates are times when we have a very super critical time bound story um or when you're working on a legacy area where it's not worth getting everybody up to speed because we're planning to replace it anyway. It's, it's crusty code that we really didn't want to touch. Um, uh, sometimes also investigative work. Again, one of the things that I find um, similar between the teams that are say that they mob all the time and the teams that selectively mob, certain things kind of come up as common criteria. Investigative and spike work oftentimes ends up being things that people want to do their own and bring solutions or bring ideas back to the mob for more um, uh, discussion and bug investigations. A lot of times uh, mobs get a little bit, uh, so one of the teams that, that mobs on a pretty regular basis, but they're very selective about what they mob they've decided that bug investigations really are solo jobs and when they get to the point of identifying a solution then they'll start to discuss it at kind of a mob level it's fascinating yeah um and in that and i my first reaction is i love full-time mobbing and i would prefer to work no other way but I love that people are experimenting with uh, different ways to go about it um that a place i previously worked uh, during is so currently in our organization we're we're not uh, we don't have sprints we don't have sprint planning that kind of thing it's just basically extreme programming mobbing and Kanban but uh, at this place there was sprint planning and so during sprint planning they would identify stories they're like hey these are good candidates for mobbing who wants to mob on these and then it would be decided at sprint planning which stories would be mobbed and which ones would be work solo I thought that was a pretty interesting experiment uh, and I've, I've also noticed even while full-time mobbing I see some of the same patterns you're talking about. Um, sometimes we'll get like an email from a third party vendor who'll be like, hey, I think we have a solution to that problem you guys reported. And what will happen is someone in the mob who's really passionate about that will be like, hey, I'm gonna go research this. And we'll be like, yeah, go forth, go do it. And we're just gonna keep mobbing the current card we're working on. Um, and so it kind of allows people who have, I don't know, they have a passion for a certain discipline or for a certain tech stack, and they wanna go experiment with something and then bring it back to the mob. Um, and so it's, it gets a kind of a fine line. It's like, is that still mobbing? It's just kind of multi-threaded mobbing or is it, uh, you know, what is it? It's, it starts to become like, you know, Socrates asking us to define a chair and we're having trouble defining it because, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. What, what are your experiences, Chris? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I would just say that uh, one thing that I see often is during learning session time, there are people that are, uh, kind of on their own uh, learning a technology and then they find times to teach it to the rest of their mob and then bring it in so that that's really common um, and then uh, just other other pieces of, of work um, I, th I think also uh, these ideas I've also seen in the past these ideas of like having a pair and a tr and a trio uh, you know a mob and a pair um, and you know something that that kind of needs to get done at the same time, but we still want everybody's eyes on everything. And so there was a mob for a time doing 
three and two and wrote on the rotations kind of sending one person over to the other. Um, so, so that, that's also a pattern I've seen um, to kind of keep everybody connected that way. Um, yeah. So it's been interesting. One of the things that I definitely noticed as this organization adopted mobbing, uh, pair programming also became much, much more common. Uh, and so you had small teams of four people where uh, two will, will pair on something and two will be ending up working on individual things that are, are, are ancillary or related. Uh, and so I, you know, where the whole group can't always mob, there's been a lot more push for pairing. Uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, um, I had a real hard time uh, at past companies getting pairing to be accepted. There was always a dynamic issue. There's a junior, senior, there's the new, the old, the journeyman, the apprentice. So that dynamic um, was, was always sort of counterintuitive or, or counterproductive to the goal. Um, and, and now what I see is when, when, when people start with mobbing and you emphasize the group perspective, you emphasize the team dynamic and not the pair dynamic, that falling into a pairing problem or, or falling down to pairing because you don't have enough people for the mob is usually a healthier pair. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's something that, that, that I've definitely noticed is a, um, it, makes, it makes adoption of pairing easier if you're, if you're generally mobbing also. Yeah, we have, we have a third person coming back, but we can pair like this for a while and we don't have to be super ego driven or or defensive or whatever else. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Yeah, it's almost like uh, mobbing. I never thought of it as mobbing as a gateway to pairing. <laughs> yeah. I hear that story a lot too, where people are saying that they've tried to introduce, I think Llewellyn's told me this and others is, is uh, you, you know, they try and, um, they try and introduce mobbing to an organization or sorry, pairing to an organization. They say, absolutely not. And then they're like, well, these guys are doing mobbing. Let's do mobbing. And they're like, remember that thing that was pairing? That looks much less expensive. Let's go do that. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> on the outside, it looks it, pairing ends up looking more effective to a like manager than mobbing. Um, and, and it's just funny that, that, you know, it, it, it's, it's evolved in such a way that mobbing has become used to convince people to pair from a management level. Um, yeah. Well, you know, in my experience, I didn't actually want to introduce mobbing at my uh, most recent organization. I was focused on the other aspects of Agile that I had mentioned I had had good success with adoption, things like unit testing, things like teaching what refactoring really is. I, I, you know, a pet peeve of mine is when I see refactor X on a backlog and it's a quote unquote full sprint item right? That you're not refactoring for a full sprint. That's a rewrite or a re-architecture. Let's use the right vocabulary so that we're talking about the right things. Refactoring is something you do on a regular basis all the time. Um, and so I was trying to teach those concepts. I was trying to teach good unit testing and test-driven development, solid design principles, design patterns, constant refactoring. And uh, the organization that was helping me with some of the teaching, um, they wanted to use mobbing as a vehicle of training. And I initially pushed back. I said, no, I, I don't want mobbing to get in the way of people hearing the unit test strategy and understanding what it, makes to, what, what it means to break uh, to decouple code so that you can have a seam where at which you can insert your unit test. I wanted people to stay focused on that on that goal. Uh, I go, I was convinced to let mobbing be the vehicle by which the training uh, was delivered, um, and I was pleasantly surprised that then teams decided, hey, we wanted to go try it. Um, uh, I think that the fun that uh, team programming br brings and mob programming is really a team programming thing. I think the idea that, um, uh, you know, many people have said for many years, software development is a team sport. Um, mobbing actually now makes that real um, and, and helps bring that to the, to the fore. So I was actually pleasantly surprised. I, I never intended mobbing to take off the way that it did uh, at, in the current, at the, my last organization. Um, and uh, it, it has, and, and now it sort of uh, has a life of its own. Um, right. With that said, I, I think sustaining mobbing is tricky. Uh, right. We definitely also have learned that uh, mobs can fall into a rut um, and that you need to take a moment to uh, retrain and, 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 and rethink how you're mobbing, uh, sometimes changing things up a little bit, uh, using retrospectives uh, on a 
slightly more frequent basis, perhaps at the end of a mob session or even before the beginning of the next mob session to think about how to improve the mob. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that, uh, that also happened was, was um, the titling, again, the titling in the mob, uh, certain individuals had certain titles and it was pretty clear that maybe they were falsely given that title. Um, and that was something that had to be dealt with a little bit as well that, you know, somebody just because they have senior in front, maybe they're not the strongest. And now it's really clear because the mob can see it. And how do you adopt and how do you suggest, or how, how do you manage that situation? Um, it's been something that was been a, an interesting learning experience from the management perspective of teams that mob uh, is how do you manage uh, discrepancy and skill level related to title? Exactly, exactly. I, I, I've seen that one in the past as well. Um, and it is, it is a very difficult, uh, a difficult question to answer for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the one thing uh, that comes to mind, kind of hitting off what you're saying earlier, is on the selective mobbing. Um, I think it's awesome that people are experimenting with it, but I think I'll bring up a point that's been brought up uh, I think by Llewellyn Falco, and I think you bring it up quite often, Lucian, is uh, anything that we think should be done solo should probably be, be automated, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's my quote. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's awesome that people are experimenting with it, um, but I always challenge that. Anytime we're tempted to go solo, um, is it something, is it just because we're embarrassed uh, that it's so simple? that we don't want to embarrass the whole mob, but maybe we want the whole mob to be embarrassed by how simple it is that the mob will automate it, right? <laughs> yeah. um, well, you know, the, the teams that, that I see that are mobbing on a full-time basis, like I said, they put in their working agreement that certain work is still done solo, and a lot of that's that, this investigative work, where yes. um, doing the investigative work as a pair or as a mob it's easy for people to fall out and not be included and not feel engaged, especially since yeah. we all have different research um, uh, paths, right? We, yeah. we research things in different ways. Uh, I like to write unit tests and experiment with code, but even then, I'm gonna to have to go find some piece of information, some, some, something before I can actually write that little unit test to drive my, my investigation. So I, I still think in you know, so, certain spike work, uh, certain bug investigations, um, they're, they're not as engaging for the mob. Yeah. Um, and so it's easier for somebody to stop thinking that mobbing is effective because they're bored because all we're doing is investigating. Um, you said earlier that those teams uh, mob on all code that goes into the production yes. side, right? So you, I, I think that what you were suggesting was that um, I think just like us, uh, we mob on all production code um, and, and then for things like research or learning or something along those lines, we go back and do it independently. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that conflicts with my quote at all. <laughs> I, I think, though, to, to you know, Austin's point, too, and, and your point, Christian, is the idea that if uh, certain stories that are not spikes um, are the, you know, well, that's going to go be done solo. Then, then I think that then we should ask, uh, uh, potentially try the, try the question of, well, should we just be automating that? Yes. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. that was my, my feeling. Um, you know, at one point as a mob, we were, uh, we were asked to work on a piece of work that was dictated by another group. And we, we said, we need to automate this. And we kind of told we weren't allowed to automate it. Um, and, uh, and so what, what, what happened was we ended up splitting up and that's when I formed this opinion was there, there was actually a key moment where I, I, I realized that solo work to me is only worth doing solo for production code. Um, uh, if you're not able to automate that solo work. And so that's where template generate, you know, generators and domain specific languages and all this other stuff, levels of abstraction. All this stuff could be made abstract enough uh, with three or four minds pouring in their best ideas, um, except when it becomes mundane, uh, repetitive rote work, right? Um, and so uh, I, that's that's where that quote came from. Was that there was a moment in time where we were all asked to 
uh, basically, you know, mob on it if you want, but we need you to do this thing, and but you're not allowed to change the way the work is done. And it was it was a fascinating experience to see how quickly mobbing fell apart as soon as that happened. Um, fascinating, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I, I think you guys are dead on that. Uh, research is a great exception and learning uh, in certain cases. And I think this all comes back to highlight what you were just saying a little bit ago, Greg. Um, I recently had a good uh, uh, remote chat with uh, Woody. And I think one thing that was pretty cool that I got out of it was um, for mobbing to go well, um, you're talking about like, oh, mobs need to be uh, kind of revamped and rechecked, checked in on and those kind of things is, you know, you need a great facilitator. You need someone who's you know, somewhat of a systems thinker who can, you know, reflect and um, say like, hey, what's going well for us? What's not going for us? What experiments can we run? It takes that kind of coach facilitator role uh, for a mob to really operate well. And I think I've heard that from all the different places that mob that I can think of. Everywhere a facilitator or coach has arisen and that's what helped mobs be great. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I mean, have you seen that, those kind of people arise in mobs in your organizations, Greg, or is it kind of more someone no. external checks in and makes sure they're retrospecting or something like that? Yeah. So No, I, I, absolutely. I think the teams that mob, um, they have somebody on, the teams that mob on a regular basis have somebody on the team, usually who's the tech lead or um, kind of, you know, uh, somewhat of a leader of the team ahead of time uh, has embraced embraced mobbing and embraced the agile mindset in a real positive fashion. Uh, and so that individual tends to help um, keep the momentum going. Uh, and then I tend to swoop in and around uh, and, uh, and, and give a lot of pushing where, where that's falling down. Um, I, I give uh, some grief to certain um, individuals who I know are somewhat dominant uh, personalities. If I see them slightly dominating uh, a mob, um, uh, I will remind teams that it's okay to take uh, – uh, our organization does not do a great job of katas on a regular basis. Um, you know, uh, I, I know that, that, that you guys work in an organization that takes a lot of pride in their kata um, – uh, usage. So I try to remind people that it's okay to take two to four hours of, out of a week for kata work and that that, kata, that, that that training work does not need to be individual training work, that it should be done sometimes as a mob. And that, that uh, I, I like to use the basketball analogy that, you know, basketball teams don't go out and play games only, they practice too. Um, and so that, that it's important for mobs to practice a little bit. Uh, and, and when you're practicing, you're not practicing, um, the code improvement always you're practicing the team improvement um, and making sure that that teamwork is part of the practice effort. So uh, I, I do think though your point is, is absolutely valid Austin that uh, without somebody who continues to remind people to improve and remind people to uh, to take a moment of retrospecting and to take a moment to identify uh, where things can get better. Uh, it, it, it can fall into a rut and it can fall apart and just stop happy, having a, the same effectiveness. Yeah. I th and I think what you said as well, uh, it seems, it seems to be somewhat of a pattern that someone internal to the mob is taking that role and hopefully more than one person. What I've usually seen is, someone's kind of doing it and someone is kind of learning to do it alongside them. I usually see that happening quite a bit. And when that, so, so to speak, leader or facilitator leaves, the other facilitator just steps right in. I've seen that happen a couple of times, but also what you said uh, was sounded uh, was important to me as well. When I've seen good mobbing, it usually has a good external coach or leader as well too, who checks in with the mob. And uh, as Chris does with us, he'll come in and do a lean coffee and, We'll, we'll bring up an issue that the mob has been discussing or debating and, uh, you know, just that third perspective on, hey, maybe you guys are having a circular conversation or, hey, maybe you could be deploying more often or, you know, that, that those little shoves or you could be writing cleaner code and you should be doing more refactoring. I've seen those have really positive impacts on mobs I've been on uh, as like a from a leadership perspective. So I yeah, think it, it, it's great to get that external to, to, to have the mob be able to speak out loud. Uh, share their experience and then have somebody who's not there be, you know, provide some extra ideas uh, in. Um, it, it definitely, uh, it's definitely a pattern that I've seen. I unfortunately don't get a chance to sit down and mob very often with the teams that are around me, but occasionally I try to. Uh, I had a goal of at least one mobbing session 
per week. Um, I, you know, had a couple weeks where I was good, a couple weeks where I yeah. wasn't. I feel like um, it's the same for me. <laughs> you know, si similarly, similarly, I try to sit in and uh, audit retrospectives and audit planning sessions and and and, and be there for demos. Uh, you know, as, as a director, that that's sort of my job. Um, uh, is is to just try to observe uh, and improve, um, and then where I can see those patterns, where many teams need the same improvements, then try to figure out a way to level up uh, a group of people at the same time. Yeah. Awesome. I, I, so I just want to point out, guys. I think we're we're up on time. Um, so Greg, is there anything that uh, you wanted to kind of uh, call out, or do you have a blog or Twitter handle or anything like that that you wanted to talk about? Or I uh, I, I don't. I'm not a great uh, um, social media um, uh, um, brand or or whatever it is these days. I, I guess I'm realizing now that I need to value. I need to build my own brand here. Yeah. Uh, everybody's got to be their own brand ambassador. Uh, but no, I, I, um, uh, I incur the, the one call out I will make is the following. Uh, one day when this COVID-19 pandemic is over, uh, we will all get back to doing the conferences. And the pitch I have is Agile Open Conferences. Yeah. Um, Agile Open is where I met Woody Zool and, and, and uh, several of your, your teammates. Um, and when I was introduced to, to mobbing as a, as a, as, as a concept. Um, and uh, I, I really think that the Agile Open uh, for developers, for Scrum Master, for everybody up and down the stack is a, are, are great uh, opportunities to learn, to get a little bit outside your comfort zone um, and, to, and to hear what's going on in the industry. So I, I think yeah. Agile Opens would be my pitch. All right, awesome. Well, we'll, we'll include that in the show notes. Um, and so I just wanted to talk to our audience and say, if, if you think that this video will be uh, helpful to anyone that you know, um, please go ahead and share it. That's the best way to get this information out there and, and send it over to them. Um, like and subscribe and all that stuff. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye, see everybody. You. Bye.